Good morning. Hi. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Um, I'd first like to say how grateful I am to live in this fantastic community. Um, I feel very fortunate, and every time I leave my house, I feel even more fortunate. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Jonas Werner, and I'm a realtor with Balsam Realty here in Freeport. Um, you are not here to buy a timeshare, so don't, don't run away. Um, <clears throat> you are in the right place. I'm here because energy costs have skyrocketed, and many of us cannot afford the increase in our energy costs. Um, I'm here because energy use is a major contributor to the destruction of the delicate environment which supports us. We don't have to wait for the government to help or save us. We can do something right now. By lowering the energy consumption in your home, you can save money, protect your investment in your home, make the world a cleaner place to live, and if we act collectively, our decreased demand for energy can also lower overall cost. As we saw at the height of the pandemic when nobody was using fossil fuels, energy companies were paying people to take away barrels of oil. Um, so here we are, Freeport Climate Action Now, Balsam Realty and Freeport Community Services have um, come together to create this program which we hope will create an opportunity for you and a pathway to saving energy, saving money, and lowering your carbon footprint. Um, a few, well, it's, it's, I'll keep going first. Uh, we have created a program which we hope will be a holistic look at your home and its energy use. Uh, we'll start by examining the whole home and learn about how the systems at your home interrelate. Next, we'll hear from a home energy expert who will share some of the best ways you can lower your energy bills while lowering your carbon footprint. Um, following this section, we'll take a 30 minute break so that you can walk around and talk with some of the presenters and ask questions and also some of the supporting organizations that we have here today. Uh, we're very lucky Freeport Can is here. You can speak with them about the work that they're doing in our community. Um, Retrofit Passive House Maine is also here to talk about uh, your home as a system. Uh, we are also graced with Vagabond Coffee. I'm not sure how much they can tell you about home energy, but they can get you a good cup of coffee. Uh, window Dressers is also here. I don't know if you're familiar with Windows Dressers, but it's a, a community program designed to provide uh, insulating window coverings uh, to help keep energy, uh, your energy use down, to help keep heat in your home, to keep it cool when it's cool, hot when it's hot. Um, and, and they're here to talk with us um, and it, it, it's an opportunity for Freeport. Um, they work in different towns where there is community desire to have them. And so if there are enough people in our community that are interested in, um, in having these windows made, uh, we can have our own program right here in Freeport if we find the support. Um, if you can afford to pay for those windows, you can pay for them. And if you can't, the program uh, makes it possible for you to get those windows. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity for us, and I hope that there's a lot of interest and we can get a program of our own here in Freeport. And then finally, when we come back together after that break, uh, we'll learn about local and state funding that's available to help you fund some of the work your home may need. Um, so while the government may not be the solution to our problems, they certainly can help make lives better. A few quick notes before I introduce our first speaker. Um, there are bathrooms right outside this door. If you turn to the left, on the left-hand side, you'll find both the women's and the men's bathroom. Um, if you have any questions today, we do have wireless mic that we can bring to you. So if you just hold up our, your hand, we'll, uh, we'll bring that over to you. Um, let's see, there is a raffle at the end of the event today. There's a uh, energy efficiency uh, basket there provided by Balsam Realty with $275 worth of um, energy saving stuff for your home and also a $50 gift certificate is in there. Um, and, uh, 
And also, <laughs> we're here to help raise money for Freeze Out. Um, there are, unfortunately, a lot of people in our community that cannot afford this increase today. Um, it's not a problem that's going to happen for them tomorrow. It's a problem that's happening this morning while we're here. So Freeze Out every year raises money in our community, community to help those people fill their oil tanks, buy wood, or whatever they need to stay warm throughout the winter. We are now, uh, we have a $20,000 goal at FCS this year. We are already at almost $12,000, and we haven't even started yet. Uh, so thank you, everybody, that have given. And, um, you know, even a dollar helps. I would also note that uh, from 12 to 2 today, if you haven't made a donation yet, if you make a donation between 12 to 2 at Bow Street Market, Kennebec Savings is going to match every donation up to $100. Wow. Yeah. I'm very excited about the opportunity to take money from a bank. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. So as I said, the government may not be the solution to all our problems, but they can certainly help. And to that end, we have invited uh, Representative Melanie Sachs here to speak with us as our keynote speaker today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by what a kid from Maine can do. That's one of my favorite mugs, just a kid from Maine. And Melanie is just another kid from Maine out doing great things. Uh, I've seen her do it here in our community and we're seeing her do it at the state level as our uh, local representative. She's now serving her second term in the Maine House of Representatives, where she's the House Chair of the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee. So if you need any money, see her. Uh, she is also appointed an appointed member of the Building Infrastructure and Housing Working Group on the Maine Climate Council. So she is our, our ear and our connection and uh, a very open ear. And um, I'd like to invite Melanie to share her thoughts with us. Melanie. Thank you so much. Are we matched? Of Almost? course we matched. Almost. She got the memo. I got the memo, apparently. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be very, very quick, because you are so not here to see me. You're here to see my dear friend Claire and John Riley and all the wonderful vendors here today. Just another little plug for the freeze out happening today as well. There's also a GoFundMe page um, that you can access if you don't have time to do it. Um, after this wonderful event, you can get go right online and make a donation today or even tomorrow. Um, my name is Melanie Sachs. I am a kid from Maine. I grew up in a trailer without plumbing at the end of a dirt road in New Sharon, Maine. Was lucky enough to go to college at Bates um, and uh, delighted and love living here in Freeport for the last few decades. I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, the reason I come to events like this is to say I really am here for you. I have had folks who have talked to me about the different things at the state level, whether it's environmental or energy policy, just to let me know what they're doing, um, what they're concerned about about what they're interested in. As Jonas had said, last year I served on both the Taxation and the Energy and Utilities and Technology Committee where we did some really great work to try and keep lower energy costs, which I know do not feel like it right now um, because of the way that natural gas prices have fluctuated. That's what's tied to your supply side of your energy bill. There are resources within the state level to help for energy efficiency. Efficiency Maine, if you visit their booth today, has some really great incentives that were funded through the state budget. What I do all day, every day now is budget. Um, and so, which for those of you who know me, totally adore. Um, nerd central, it's awesome. Um, and, but I feel like the budget is a value document. It talks about our priorities. And the state of Maine values very much energy efficiency, environmental stewardship, and it's been reflected these last four years in these budgets. So that's why I'm here is to say, please let me know. My cell number, I think almost everybody has it, but it's 207-299-6825. Been the same one since I was a scout master back in 2007. Um, so please call me if you have any questions, concerns, any um, information you need on state incentives. We're doing some really good bills this year to continue that work. For those of you who don't know 
know, I also got certified as an energy policy planter, planner over the last, planter maybe, but planner, yes, not a planter, Claire. Um, planner over the last year as well because I'm deeply interested in our survival. I talk about energy, I'm a social worker as many of you know. Energy underlies everything we do. It is the safety, it is the connectedness, it is the health. Keeping people connected, warm, and safe in their homes all relies on energy, which you don't really think about it in that context. And how do we move to a beneficial electrification, which is good for everyone, um, in a way that doesn't break the bank for our individual members. So that's the lens with which I think about energy. It's the lens with which I do my work. And it is always with the lens of this amazing community. So thank you so much for having me here. Enjoy the day. Excited to hear some of the things that are happening. Thanks so much. Melanie, thank you so much. Representative Sachs, I mean. All right. Next up, uh, we are going to take a holistic look at the home and its systems. And um, this is sections called Understanding Your Home's Construction, Energy Systems, and Air. And we'll talk about the flow and long-term health of your home. How does it, and uh, we'll talk about how a home energy audit can help you better understand your home and help you prioritize um, getting um, your home energy use lowered. The presenters we have today are John Riley from Casco Bay Insulation. This is a company that insulates and air seals home, homes. John Riley was a HERS raider working with builders, homeowners to create durable, comfortable homes. A HERS raider is just a home energy rating. I had to look that up because it sounded kind of sexist at first, and I just wanted to make sure we didn't have the wrong person here. Um, we also have Claire Betts here, is a licensed professional engineer, energy auditor, ResNet certified, and she's also a HERS Raider, um, and BPA certified building analyst. <clears throat> She is the owner of Building Works LLC, a residential energy consulting firm specializing in a holistic and integrative approach to improve the performance of new and existing buildings. Without further ado, would you please take it away, Claire and John. <laughs> All right. Can everybody hear us okay? Great. Okay. I don't know how long we're going to stay sitting. Um, we're usually <laughs> um, uh, standing up. We've got a mic right here. So I'm Claire, and he's John, obviously. And I'm going to start off the presentation talking about a holistic approach to how we should be weatherizing our homes and walk you through the steps of an energy audit. And then John's going to jump in, and he's going to talk about the materials and the methods that are actually used on our weatherization projects. John is a dear friend and a colleague, and we've worked together on more weatherization projects and new construction projects than I care to admit. You can tell by the, the color of my hair, and there's kind of a disconnect here, so you're right if you're thinking that John's been doing this since he's like two years old. <laughs> um, so we're going to get started, and we're going to talk about that holistic approach. And that holistic approach recognizes that our homes work as systems, and that all of these systems interact with one another. So if we go in with a singular focus of just attacking one of those systems, say we're uncomfortable or we have ice dams and we just go in to tighten up that home, we're not considering the unintended consequences that can happen. An example of this is tightening up and weatherizing a home without considering that our heating equipment gets its air for proper combustion from the house itself. We can actually starve that equipment from the air that it needs for proper and safe operation, backdraft the chimney and cause some safety and health issues. And so how do we go from a home, and many of our existing homes, mine included, are really leaky and poorly insulated to a home that we've tightened up, we improve on the insulation. How do we do it safely? We do it by keeping building science principles in mind that I'm gonna talk about and walk you through a little bit and with an energy audit. 
so that we make sure that we're not doing any harm when we weatherize our homes. First, do no harm. The first thing we need to, to understand is that we need to manage the moisture in our homes before we can get started with the weatherization. Maine has some of the oldest housing stock in the nation, and there are plenty of wet, damp basements and crawl spaces that, that are in here. Um, and that moisture can come from dirt floors under our crawl spaces and that are in some of our basements. It can come from water intrusion from not managing the water that's draining from our roof. It falls next to the foundation and comes into the basement. We need to proactively manage that moisture before we can get started. We also need to manage the moisture from just everyday living in our homes. And that, that is from bathing and showering and from cooking. And bath vans are often upgraded as part of our weatherization projects. If we don't do that, then we suffer the consequences of that. And that could be basically um, showing up in our attics as frost, which leads to deterioration and rot. It can show up as mold, which can cause safety and health issues. So we really need to be proactive in managing the moisture. And oftentimes, that's the largest part of our weatherization projects, because it's, it's a big deal um, to manage and manage appropriately. Once we do that, then we can get started with the actual weatherization in terms of stopping air leakage that happens and insulating properly. Air leakage actually has the greatest impact on comfort and building durability. And what ends up happening is that warm air in the winter months that we're trying to keep in our homes, it's actually more buoyant. So it's pushing to get outside because hot always wants to get to cold. As it does that, it fills in from the bottom. And those air leaks find their way through recess can lights, through light fixtures, through ceiling fans, and penetrations that go to the outside. This is known as the stack effect. And one thing that we need to remember about the stack effect is that there's a driving force behind it. On a cold day like today that are single digits and zero degrees, that difference between the outside temperature and the inside temperature of around 70 degrees, that's really, we're feeling that full effect of the stack effect in that air cycling through our homes. So the other thing that we need to understand is that for every cubic foot of air that presses out, gets to the outside, a cubic foot of air comes in from the inside. That's just physics. It wants to reach a point of equilibrium. Comes in from below. So we really need to air seal those leaks. And that's the first order of business in any weatherization project after we've managed the moisture. From there, we go to insulation in terms of what kind of insulation is it, how much of it do we have, and where in the world should we put it? Sometimes we find that the insulation is installed and it may not be the most effective place to put it. But what we're really trying to do is align that insulation with our air ceiling so that we define the building envelope and the thermal and pressure boundary of our homes. And oftentimes that is at the foundation wall, it's at the exterior wall, along the lid or possibly along the roof line. Sometimes it's at the floor, like at, you know, over a crawl space, but more often than not, we're insulating an air ceiling at the foundation wall. You can think about air ceiling and insulation working together because that's where they're most effective. By thinking about going outside on a windy day with just a fleece on, that wind is going to blow right through your fleece. But if you put a Gore-Tex jacket on over that, you're going to be a lot warmer. So that Gore-Tex jacket is the air sealing and your fleece is the insulation. And they work much better when they're aligned and they're working together. So we take all this information and that is what the energy auditor is using when he looks through or, or she. It's a new age. Yes. <laughs> When that auditor looks through your house. And so it could be an independent auditor like me who doesn't do the actual work, or it could be an all-in-one auditor that's part of a construction or contract, ooh, contracting firm that does the work. 
Each of them has their disadvantages. As an independent energy auditor, my audits are usually more comprehensive than what would occur from an all-in-one, but not necessarily. The first thing that we're doing is a site condition survey. After we talk to the homeowner and understand really what the complaints and concerns are, and that starts at the outside of the house. We're looking at how that water that falls on the roof is being managed. Is it managed with gutters? And if it is, then what kind of condition are those gutters in? Are they being maintained? Do they have vegetation growing at them, like shown on that photo? Is there ice damming? This is a great time of year to understand whether ice damming is happening, because you can actually see it. The snow's been on our roof. It melts, and we can see those icicles hanging down. Um, does it have a lot of vegetation around the building or overhanging the roof? That vegetation holds moisture against our homes, and that affects overall building durability. And then where are the exterior vents located? If I see a plumbing stack up through the roof, but I don't see a vent for a bath fan, then I'm wondering what's happening in there. And when I go inside, I make a note to think about what's happening with that vent. Are there opportunities? How is the house oriented? Um, are there opportunities for solar panels? From there, we go down to the basements and the crawl spaces, which are places that we don't mm. usually spend yeah. <laughs> a lot of time in, nor do we want to. And sometimes we're just surprised by what we see. Um, the one thing we need to remember is that these spaces, even though we're not living down there, they are connected to our living space. This is actually a photo of a couple of different types of insulation that was installed in a home that had a dirt floor that basically the moisture came up and that accumulated on the pink insulation that you can see on the floor. It got heavy and fell down from the basement ceiling. And then another contractor came in and sprayed the wrong kind of insulation along the rubble foundation wall. Um, and so, you know, those are things that we're looking for. And even though we don't want to acknowledge it because of sometimes these conditions that we have, they do influence what's happening in our indoor environment and our living space. I think Richard's gonna touch on this in a little bit, but this is also a picture of an opening to a bulkhead. This is a huge hole in our building envelope and something that can be easily addressed by putting a door there. More often than not, the doors are thin wood. You can see a lot of daylight through them and that's a big hole in our building envelope. We're looking at impacts to indoor air quality, whether it's a connection between the basement and the crawl space, or it's from a central vacuum cleaner that's, that's located in our basements that's not vented to the outside. We're capturing these big particulates that, we're, that we get from the vacuum cleaner, but when it exhausts inside our basement, then that fine dust and particles, it's just recycling back into our living space. So we wanna make sure that that vent is extended to the outside. We're looking for health and safety issues as well. And that could be asbestos insulation that we often find on older steam heating systems usually um, around the piping. This is actually a picture of a, on the upper left is a picture of an old boiler that was original to, an, to a house that was built in the early 1900s, it was covered in asbestos. So when we see these safety issues, we know that we're not able to do the, all the testing um, that we need to do as part of an energy audit. There's also combustion safety issues. Unvented gas log sets are, are another, another kind of safety issue. They basically emit carbon monoxide, and those are things that we don't want in our house, especially as we work to tighten them up. From there, we go to the attic. We're still looking for safety issues, and sometimes we find vermiculite insulation, which is shown in the upper right um, picture. Vermiculite was used as insulation up until about the 1970s. This insulation came from, most of it in, in the US came from a mine in North Dakota, and that contained a vein of asbestos. So as an energy auditor, every time we see Vermiculite, we know that we can't do any testing because it could potentially harm our health and safety. 
We're looking for some knob and tube wiring in older houses. Some, most of it is usually disconnected, but we want to test it to make sure that there isn't anything live because we can't do weatherization without making sure that it's safe. And then again, we're looking at how much insulation we have, what type it is, and where it's located. In the graphic, we're showing basically a picture of a knee wall attic. Um, and really where we want to insulate, I'm gonna get up and you're gonna tackle That's me, fine. aren't you? No, we got the microphone ready. Where you, Here you want go. It? You gotta do it. Okay. You're famous now. Okay. <laughs> where we really want to insulate is at the roof line, but many times you see it insulated on this vertical wall and along the attic floor. It's more effective when it's insulated here most often. All that fiberglass in that upper left hand picture was all bright yellow when it was put in. We're looking for big holes because big holes are big heat loss and those could be holes created by chimneys, by utilities. If you can look, oh boy, yeah. this one I have to point out <laughs> because I don't think you can see it very well, but this is a big case <laughs> with John standing in it that was in an old farmhouse that we worked on. That's how big that hole was. Um, and it was directly open from the living space up into the attic. <laughs> We're looking for basically dirty insulation. You can see the fiberglass insulation that, has the, that is darker color. It's darker in color because there's air movement around it. And what that insulation is doing is filtering out particulates in the air and that's making it dirty. We're looking at where the bath fans vent. Sometimes we find them vented into the attic when they essentially need to be vented to the, directly to the outside. From there, we get to the testing in terms of quantifying the air leakage um, through the air leaks that we are seeing. That happens with the blower door, which is essentially a big fan that we put in a centrally located door. We have a manometer, and so what we're doing is depressurizing the house to a level that simulates a 20 mile an hour wind blowing on the outside of the house. And then we're measuring the airflow as we pull it out of the house and pull outside air in. The higher the blower door number, the leakier the house is. The lower the blower door number, the tighter the house is. We want that to be a low number after we weatherize. We often couple blower door testing with, thermal, with a thermal imaging camera so that we can see things that we can't um, put our eyes on during the audit itself. This is a photo of a thermal image showing that there's no insulation in the walls. You can tell by the dark color of the walls. And you can actually even see air leakage happening, on a, especially on a day like today. And you can see I still can't stop moving my arms around, but that picture actually makes a lot more sense than me waving my arms around. <laughs> Then we're going to the mechanical systems. What kind of fuel do they use? Have they been serviced regularly? This is a picture of a, I know, I know. Okay. this is a picture of an old boiler that has a tankless coil for water heating, which is very inefficient. We're looking at where it gets its air from for combustion. This is a natural, uh, an atmospherically drafted natural gas water heater. And this boiler has a barometric damper. So it's getting its air from inside the house in the basement. Yeah. And oftentimes for weatherization, we're addressing that combustion safety. And we're recommending that a heating technician put outside air direct to that heating equipment so it can always operate safely. Sometimes it, it is just a passive duct that's connected directly to the burner of a boiler or a furnace. Sometimes it's a, called a fan in a can, which is exactly what its name kind of implies. It has a fan in it and it's pulling outside air into the house so it pressurizes the basement to ensure that that piece of equipment has the air that it needs for safe operation. Then we're also looking for opportunities. Opportunities to reduce our usage of energy and fossil fuels. And air source heat pumps are a big opportunity. Most of you probably have one in your house by now. Um, they actually are, don't, do not use fossil fuels. They can provide heating and cooling. They can be either ducted 
which looks very similar to a furnace, or they can be ductless. And they're connected to an outdoor unit with refrigeration lines. This same technology, which is very effective in cold climates, can be used for water heating. And there's a picture of a heat pump water heater um, also in the slide. So we take all this information and we basically give the homeowner a report and we prioritize the recommendations for energy improvements. And that gives you a roadmap so that you can keep moving with improving the performance and the comfort and the durability of your home. And you can do that without always moving forward and without going backwards. So I'm gonna turn it over to John now and he's gonna walk you through some of those weatherization measures. All right. All right, all right, nicely done. Well done, Claire, thank you. So I'm actually, I'm gonna try and sit down. I'm gonna, I, I gotta be contained. Do yeah. I, I don't uh, think you can do it. I think <laughs> you take that time. So an auditor like Claire uh, has done an energy audit. We've come up with, this, with some scopes of work for the building. We've, you know, they've tailored the scope of work, hopefully to the budget of the homeowner. Um, we got to decide where we're going to start. So, oh, sorry. Man, I might have to stand You're up. Do it. Oh, God. All right. I can do this. I can do this. There's some new things here <laughs> sitting down. Um, so, we, we want to start spending money in ways that we get the most bang for our buck. And considering all these health and safety issues and balancing that with um, what we want to get out of the you know, performance of the building envelope. We want to start in an area where we're going to be addressing both of those issues. And that's typically, you know, we want to get ahead of the moisture issues and we want to add insulation. So usually we're starting down in the basement. Um, so to effectively deal with like an older basement or older crawl space, the best way to deal with the water first is to keep it from getting in there to begin with. And so this is a homeowner project that could probably easily be done. But the idea is that. Um, th this is a situation uh, that a lot of us have where water is falling right down off the roof line next to the house and finding its way down into, like, say, if you have a rubble foundation wall or a stack stone foundation wall, a lot of times that water is just dropping right down and running down into the space. So we're looking at the site. We're taking, you know, Claire's uh, thoughts on how we can deal with the grading around the building, and we're trying to shed as much water away as we can. This is called a, I call this a ground, well, gr French, is it a ground gutter? Yeah. Sounds a little uncomfortable couth, but uh, anyway, uh, so we're, we're putting down a vapor barrier down below grade and we're pitching it down and away from the house. We're using crushed stone. Um, a lot of times we're also using a perforated pipe and we're creating a pathway for the water to shed right away from the building. You're going to give me a good kick if I'm running way over, right? All right, good. Uh, once the water's in, it, once we've done that, we've made sure we've shed as much as we can away from the house, uh, we got to deal with whatever's there. Uh, this guy's name is Alex. He was having maybe the best work day of his life uh, this day with that jackhammer. He showed up. This is out on Shabig too. So I handed him the jackhammer and said, put these headphones on and rock out for eight hours down in this hole, but, uh, which filled with water as soon as we <laughs> started jackhammering. But anyway, we got to get away uh, to, to pump this water out. There's some companies out that actually, that what they do is sump pumps and mo basement moisture mitigation. Uh, the sump pump should be sealed. Um, we're also thinking about radon with older houses as we're tightening it up. It's best if these systems, you know, can work with, you know, a radon pump as well. Um, this really should be a pretty large base and it shouldn't just be a hole in the ground. Um, I've seen a lot of just like kind of smashed holes with half a bucket in it. That, you, you burn out a uh, sump pump really quick when there's not a big reservoir, you know, of water for it to pump through. So this really should be something that's, you know, built with purpose and gets the water directly to the exterior. Um, from there, we're encapsulating the spaces. Um, we're going a lot further. I'm sure a lot of folks have seen the, uh, the casual plastic thrown down over, over a crawl space floor. It certainly helps. And if you're on a really tight budget, that, that's certainly better than nothing. But if you're making an investment and really looking at tightening up the home, we're trying to install products and practices that are going to last as long as you're there, you know. So we're using, this is a six, 16 mil vapor barrier. Um, it's heavy duty. It comes with its own suite of tapes and sealants. Um, we encapsulate the space um, and we make sure that no water or moisture is coming up uh, from the earth into the house. Because what happens in the basement happens in the house. Um, 
This is a, a poured foundation wall. Sorry, that now that they're so big, I realize that I need to get some sharper images here. They're a little grainy, but th this, is a, this is a foundation wall where we've attached a rigid foam board to the foundation wall using these masonry pens that hold it nice and tight. Um, this is a Class A fire rated product. You know, it's designed to be left exposed in basements, and we're typically going out to around, it's usually around R13 on the foundation wall. Um, this is doing a couple things. One, these are spaces that are usually totally uninsulated. So when we're thinking about spending money on the building envelope, we want to start where we're having the most impact as well. And so if you have a cold, uninsulated foundation wall, that is a great place uh, to, to start because you're starting at R0. Anything above R0, you're, you're, you're at making a lot of impact on comfort on the home. These are also areas where when you're air sealing, you're slowing down that cold air movement in the wintertime. Remember Claire talked about the stack effect. These are the areas where that negative pressure is actively just drawing that cold air right in across your first floor and causing comfort issues upstairs. Um, up above in the rim joist, this, in this situation we're using a closed cell spray foam product. Um, I, I personally am not a huge, I, I recognize the need for closed cell foams. I'm typically trying to find ways to do, do this work without uh, closed cell, you know, the truck spray applied foams. Um, but whatever we do, we want to air seal that rim joist and make sure that we get some R value there that's tied over uh, continuously onto the uh, foundation wall insulation. This is a rubble wall that's some, that we've spray foamed. Um, again, always closed cell spray foam. A rubble wall, there's really no other product that I know of that's, that's going to fit the bill. Again. High, a lot of R value, but also we're stopping a ton of moisture from moving through that foundation wall and, and being drawn up into the house where it can cause condensation and mold issues. We're stopping a lot of that. Um, the other thing you can see in this image is there's a, um, uh, some combustion air coming down, uh, down to the boiler. You can see the, the, the four inch, you know, the silver pipe there coming through. That's an old basement window that we sealed up. Um, and then uh, we brought in some fresh air um, for the mechanical contractor uh, for the boiler um, down in those spaces. Oh God, yeah, okay. Makes you question your sanity a little bit when you look down in this. Yeah, this is the same guy that was running the jackhammer earlier. He's not with me anymore, I don't, I don't know what happened. We, we had such a good thing going. Um, I buy him a sandwich every few days, like it was, just not enough trade-off, I guess. This is one that we dropped down into, and uh, you know, as a sales guy, Richard, uh, you know, anybody who a contractor can rec recognize this. If you're doing some, a sales call and you kind of stick your head down in there, it looks fine. We can do that, no problem. <laughs> this is going to be great. And then we show up, and you realize that it's you know, it's going to be a belly crawl. And oh yeah, I didn't notice that couple inches of water down there either. Uh, oh yeah. Might want to get the Tyvek suit for that one. Um, anywho, I'm sorry. So we got to we got to pull all this stuff out. All this stuff is inside your building envelope, and that means that it's 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 putting things into the air that you breathe, and none of this is good for you. We want to make sure that when we tighten up the house, um, we're making the indoor you know the indoor air quality better, not not worse. Um, so it's all got to be kind of holistically tied together. So we got to muck it out if it's an old farmhouse. We're looking through, it's like an archeological dig. You're going back uh, through the generations. You're finding the shutters that great granddad made and all kinds of stuff turning to pulp down in the uh, crawl space. Uh, touching on the basement door or crawl space door. Um, when I first started out, I really, you know, this is low hanging fruit. I'm gonna back up. This is the low hanging fruit. Uh, this is a place usually that's just wide open. Claire showed you that picture where there was nothing installed. I often see doors that are just kind of hanging on by a thread just to keep the raccoons out. Um, and that, that is just an open invitation for cold air coming in. And again, this cold air that's coming in, this is cold air that you've got to pay to reheat. It's making you uncomfortable and you're paying to reheat it. And it's just, it's a vicious cycle that costs you money and makes, makes you unhappy. Um, but that's a project that a lot of carpenters, too, can wrap their head around pretty easily. So in terms of finding people to help you with this or doing it yourself, installing a door is something that a lot of, a lot of folks can wrap their head around. Um, let's see, attic spaces. We gotta define the space and make sure that um, also, you know, 
kind of thinking about how systems are going to be upgraded here um, moving forward. Now that you have your high performance home, you're probably, you know, you're looking to probably to electrify and start using uh, more advanced systems. We've got to have a place to put this stuff, especially if it's going to be a ducted system. So we need to decide, are we doing the rafters, you know, to create a condition space, or are we doing the flat attic? Um, so, and that, that's going to, you know, impact the type of insulation we, you know, decide to use. Um, certainly going to impact the cost, um, but anywho, sometimes we're using, um, you know, spray foam, sometimes we're using dense pack cellulose. Usually the auditor has already uh, worked through these decisions with the homeowner. It's hopefully worked through with the bigger plan um, about where their systems are going to be located, and then we act accordingly. Yep, yummy. All right. This is still being done, by the way. This is, this is a, we, we haven't said the F word a lot here. Uh, but f fiberglass, is there anybody from, is there a Pink Panther in the back of the room? No? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, when we're choosing insulation materials, we want to choose insulation materials that both have a decent R value, but are also helping to slow air movement. Remember Claire said air movement's a big piece of uh, the comfort and energy puzzle. Um, that uncontrolled air movement's moving a lot of heat uh, through the building envelope. So when I see something like this where there's a lot of attic, like there's, I call it a transition, but you know, it's not just a flat attic. It goes to a wall and then it goes up and then it goes across and then there's another wall. Every time you see a transition like that, that's a place where there's probably a lot of air movement happening. And so, and then, yeah, and then when you add, put fiberglass on top of that, uh, fiberglass does not stop air movement, so it essentially bypasses that insulation material pretty effectively. Oh, geez. Come on, I'm just got on a roll. Anyway, um, we're looking for, you know, hopefully this has already been figured out. This is a multifamily with a party wall. Uh, the fiberglass, you can see, we know that air movement's happening because the air is flowing through this fiberglass and depositing all the dust, and that's where the mold, you know, once you get dust and a little bit of moisture, that's where molds and mildews grow. Um, we're sealing everything up before we insulate. Um, you can see the cellulose in the background there. This is an old church, but we're doing a lot of using rigid foam to kind of bridge the gap. In an older house, you're going to have interior walls that might not have a top plate, you know, so you actually have places where you can look down in, or that slide of where I'm down inside a hole. That's something that we would put a piece of rigid foam board right over to seal it up, and then we'd add insulation over that. Uh, the ceiling up the chimney is a big one. This is usually a chase that runs from the basement all the way up to the attic. So this is a, this is a way that anything happening in the basement moves up into the house pretty readily. We're using steel flashing and fire rated caulking to seal that up. Um, we got to make sure that the attics are vented correctly. Um, you know, we're talking about ventilation a lot of different ways with these, with an existing home. We're talking about uh, the ventilation within the home where we're dealing with bath fans and moisture that we're creating as occupants. We also need to make sure that our attic spaces that are supposed to be the same temperature and humidity as the outside, we need to make sure that those are vented appropriately as well. So we usually use, this is a product called AccuVent that we install. This would be what we would call a high-low um, vent strategy where the air comes in through the soffit and then it exits through a ridge vent, um, which I'm sure a lot of folks have seen. And then the attic hatch. Uh, Wes calls it the, my dad calls it the screen door in the submarine. I don't know where he picked it up. I'm sure there's somebody uh, that, that started that somewhere else. But anyway, um, I've seen, when I go out to look at a house, I, I typically am not the, the first person to look at it or work on it. Um, right now, when I work on a house, I might be the third, gen third generation contractor to go in. And a lot of times, They've done some insulation or added something, but they still have like just a board over a hole in the ceiling where air can just easily bypass and flow around all of their work. So taking time on this, pull down stairs are really tricky, but generally speaking, we're sealing it up, weather stripping uh, and rigid foam board on the back of the hatch cover. Um, we talked about the bath fans a little bit. Uh, making sure that this is this is this is where, as a weatherizer, it gets a little complicated because you got to have you got to wear a lot of hats. Um, the bath fan is critical. Usually, nobody wants to do it because it's a pain in the butt. Um, but as a weatherizer, you know, hopefully we're coordinating with an electrician to upgrade the bath fan, and then we're usually taking care of the duct work, which should be rigid metal duct work, 
vented directly to the exterior of the building. Um, that's all done before we can add any more insulation. Once we insulate, if there's a bath fan that's even remotely ready to be replaced, um, I'm pushing to do it because once we insulate, an electrician's gonna have to do a backstroke through like 18 inches of cellulose to find the fan again. Um, and their number's probably gonna be higher if they gotta wear a snorkel to get where they gotta work. And this is where we're at. We're installing 16 inches. I would even say, you know, when I started, we were doing 14 inches, and that was pretty good. Now on most of our new construction jobs, we're doing 16 inches to meet modern energy code. I would say uh, we're blowing 18 inches most of the time now just because we're up there. Like, let's, let's hit the R60 R value, which is a great, great balance point, um, and going a little bit past R49. Exterior walls are usually last. When we look at the building, at that uh, stack effect, you know, we're talking a lot about how the air is leaving through the top. We're talking a lot about how the air is coming through in through the bottom. If you seal those two areas up, you get a band of somewhat neutral pressure at the middle of the house, you know, where all the doors and windows are. Um, so the house is a lot less impacted um, by air movement if, if your, your basement and your attic are really well sealed. However, if you're doing a siding project or if we know that there's no insulation in the walls at all, that's a great time to do that and go through that effort. Um, and so we're using, you know, this is a case where there was a pocket door. Sometimes we have to actually open things up even further so we can air seal. But typically it's something like the image on the right where, you know, we're drilling holes, we're using a tube. It's not like back in the day where they would just stick a nozzle in the wall, wait till it stopped. And all set, must be good, it stopped working. Uh, technology has come a long way. Uh, we are using, we are making sure that all of these walls are installed out past three and a half pounds a cubic foot. We're using practices and equipment that's a lot better than the 70s and 80s. Um, and we're making sure that there's no air pockets or settling cellulose. We've been battling that, that, that thought for a long time. Um, if somebody's taking their time and they know what they're doing, it is very safe uh, and very effective to dense pack an existing wall. It's just an expensive project because it's a finished surface, right? So you got to have a contractor or you need to take it apart and then you got to put it back together, which pushes the price up, pushes the payback out a little bit. Um, and that's why spaces we can get to, like your basement and your attic, those are really effective places to work because we don't have to worry about the cost of getting into those, you know, finished spaces and finished assemblies. How's that? Speed round. <laughs> All right. <laughs> John and Claire, very much. If we could just hang one second. We are gonna, as I said, after this next next part of the of, of the presentation, uh, take a, a break so that you can talk to these people and ask questions. But are there any questions right now while we have these two here? I, I have one of my own too, yes. Oh, well here's a microphone coming up. I saw on a number of the earlier illustrations uh, the dryer vent as a source of cold air. What do you recommend for Dealing with that. Dealing with that, yeah. Um, so the dryer vent, yeah. Uh, it shouldn't look like a slinky. <laughs> it, should, uh, it should be rigid metal ductwork. It should go through typically your rim joist. And then that opening, you know, when you're looking up there, usually you see a lot of cobwebs. Uh, if there's air movement, that's where the spiders tend to make their, their habitats. So that would be, uh, you know, like the canned foam product around that, I believe. I don't think that needs to be a Around where the ductwork goes through the exterior wall? No, there's actually, you, you should have a damper on it. No screen, but a damper. It's really around the, the through when it, the ductwork goes through the wall. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Other questions? Hey, uh, I, I understand the the need for spray foams and um, rigid foam board. Uh, there is a carbon footprint to those products. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, cellulose where you can um, put that. I, you didn't mention wet pack cellulose. I wonder, is that an option around here? Is it an option in a, in a um, like a slanted roof assembly? Um, and then, also, are you looking forward to the, um, the uh, new foam products made in Maine from, from wood products? And 
are, is is there any hope that those can be used in some of these like basement conditions or is there ever going to be a truck like spray foam that that is sustainable like those products are yeah there was a lot there mm -hmm. uh <laughs> <coughs> see me after class uh so uh question one was the i think we're using i'm gonna start okay you go ahead roll yeah, in. Yeah. um yeah. i think we're we're trying not to use foam where we can in existing homes that have rubble foundation walls which we have a ton of those um, there really isn't a lot of other products they've made strides in terms of low global warming impact foams and so we would spec that so that it has less of a, a carbon impact than what used to happen but sometimes we don't have a choice we're getting more clever at that rim joist where the house sits on the foundation wall and trying not to use foam there. And I think actually we've been able to, yeah, to do that. I've come up with, we've come up as a, as a community, we've come up with strategies where we can eliminate the spray foam at the rim joist in particular. Um, I'll say that spray foam is its own air barrier. And so going to the conversation about making sure that our, our, vape, our air barrier and our, 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 our value are all in the same spot, when you look, and, and also dealing with water, it's also, it's also a vapor barrier. So when you look at a masonry surface, there is no product other than a closed cell foam now or on the horizon that will be able to supplant that. So I think we're stuck with closed cell foam probably in the long term, especially on existing foundation walls. Um, cellulose, uh, they first called it a, uh, talk about the different ways that that's installed. First they called it a wet spray. Uh, then they called it a damp spray. And I think they're calling it a high humidity application now. Uh, there, there are no contractors in Maine that I know of or really, there might be some in New Hampshire or Massachusetts, but there's, there's an issue. You know, we've been talking a lot about keeping water out of a house. One, in an existing, yeah. Picture on a day like today, a contractor setting up and using, you know, something that needs water. To, to install, you know. Um, it's gonna freeze and it's, the water's not gonna escape very effectively. So up here it's all dry blown all the time. Um, the Timber HP guys, is there anybody in the room from Timber HP? They're everywhere now. I am really excited. I'm really excited. This would be a local product. They're looking at making a product that's similar to cellulose. You know, it's cellulose without that making newspaper step. Um, but um, you know they're they're working on getting their product their production lines going, and I could see because with cellulose we are obviously I'm assuming everybody in here buys their newspaper every morning um, or has it delivered. Obviously, uh, we're running out of base material. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you got the the, the uh, news flash, but newspapers aren't growing right now. So uh, thinking about being able to use byproduct from the timber industry. Um, and making it in Maine and cutting on and saving on all that shipping. That's got huge potential to have a great impact on our environment and uh, create jobs in Maine. It's got a lot of synergy going on there. That's the magic word, synergy. Yeah. Does that answer everything? There's the, they have a rigid product. Yeah. So rigid foam, uh, they do, the, the wood fiber products that they're making are not new. They're, they've been in Europe a long time. Um, I'm excited about that. Would, would, what, he, what we're talking about is a wood fiber board that's a high density. Um, all the fibers are coated in like a paraffin wax, so it's hygrophobic. Um, and it has a decent R value. It's not as much as closed cell foam board, like if you're putting rigid foam on the outside of your, wall, of your house. Uh, but it's a, it's a decent R value. And I, I, do, I'm, I think it's going to have a pretty big impact on the way that we build up here. I think you're going to see a lot more of that and a lot less rigid foam board on the outside of houses. Take one more question. In the back there, what do you got? And I'm sorry, uh, but we will get all of your questions answered in between. Thank you. Um, I had built my house back in the early 70s, and it's uh, like a two by four house and so forth. And the question I have is on the foundation. You mentioned uh, putting insulation on the inside. And uh, when I built my house, uh, I did not put the uh, rigid foam on the outside of the foundation. It wasn't done too much in those days. Uh, so would you be better off to dig down around and put that on the outside of the foundation or 
on the inside. How would you determine? There is no, I have no water issue with the house. The drainage is very good. Yeah. So when we insulate a foundation wall, the area that I'm most concerned about is that couple few feet of concrete that's above grade that's adjacent to the cold temperatures outside. And when you insulate a foundation wall on the outside, and it still, again, still happens today, a, you know, on new construction sites, I see it a lot. There's a plan to do exterior rigid foam, but when they come up to figure out how they're gonna tie it into the wall, the exterior wall of the house, there's no great way to make that transition with the thickness of the foam back into your exterior wall assembly. And so what do they do? They tell the guy pushing the, the broom to drop the broom, grab his knife, and cut it off at grade. And so you wind up in a, with a scenario where you have that top couple feet of concrete that's exposed. So with existing homes especially, and even on new construction stuff, I'm pushing for it. Uh, because it's not just, even if you did, were able to get it up above grade, you still have weed whackers and soccer balls, and that foam doesn't hold up very well. It wouldn't around my house anyway. I know my kids would be walking in with chunks of it, like, hey, Dad, check this out. Uh, oh, great, good, that's fine. Just take money out of your college fund to heat the house, it's all good. Um, so, uh, so typically, it's on the inside um, is, is where that lands and is most effective. John and Claire, thank you so much. I Thank you. I have to say I had no idea energy people were so funny. This is better than a lot of comedy shows I've been to. Thank you so much. Um, a, couple, uh, a couple other quick notes here before we introduce our next speaker. The, um, the state of Maine has created a climate action plan. So as our climate continues to change, um, how are we going to deal with those changes that come toward us? And um, Freeport has uh, formed a committee, the Freeport Sustainability Advisory, Advisory Board. Board. Thank you. And they are um, chartered by the town to figure out a climate action plan for Freeport. We have a representative here uh, out in the hall for the Freeport Sustainability Advisory Board. I did it. Um, outside, and right now they're in the information gathering stage, and they're really looking for input from us as well. They have a sign up out there um, where you can be kept abreast of what they're doing and what they're learning as they form our action plan. Um, one other quick note is um, this is something I learned last year, so maybe everybody in the room is going to laugh at me when I say this, but this thing, this QR code, You'll see them all over the place and all over the room. Um, and the way they work, I, I used to have so many pictures on my phone of these. They were just photographs of this, and it never brought me anywhere. So anyway, for those of you who haven't found this out yet, you just point your phone at this. And uh, when the photo camera is turned on, and then a little yellow box will show up. And you touch that little yellow box, and it will bring you to a website with the information you seek. Pretty cool. It will not work if you take a photograph of it. I promise. <laughs> I have a lot of those. So, so now we're getting to a part of this that I really uh, enjoy, the, the DIY part of it. How do I, with my limited resources and knowledge, make my home save more energy? Um, and um, like many of you during COVID, I had an opportunity to look at my home in this way, and I spent a lot of time walking around with a cock gun and sealing up little holes and finding things to put at the bottoms of doors and everything I could to improve the efficiency of my home. And as we found out today, it's just not about keeping the heat out, but it's also about the whole system. But, but this, is, this is my favorite part. Um, and we do have a list here of some of our favorite energy saving techniques. I don't know if you brought one, Richard, did you? I got 10. 10. Okay, and there's a, there's a monster checklist that we created, Kate and I, uh, out at that back table at the Balsam Realty table. Um, you know, it, it start small, but each little thing you do will make a difference, and together it can really change things at your house. So our next presenter, um, I think of him as the handsome, handsomest man in energy efficiency, is Richard Burbank. He is the co-owner of Evergreen, uh, home Performance. Uh, he founded Evergreen Home Performance in 2006 
and serves as the president and CEO and energy advisor. Uh, Richard serves on the board of efficiency uh, first, uh, a national home performance contractor trade group and actively advocates for federal and state energy uh, efficiency policy. Richard, thank you so much for being here. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Testing one, two, three. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, first off, I just want to address what do-it-yourself means in Maine. And I come from a long line of do-it-yourselfers. For example, my grandfather, uh, he had a dream of building a new home. He was in New Hampshire, but it's New England, do-it-yourself. So, you know, he had a foundation to dig, so he bought a backhoe. You know, th there's a whole range of do-it-yourself. So, so I want to honor that tradition because some of us, do-it-yourself means you build everything by yourself. And that's how my father did it. Uh, built a garage, then a barn, then additions. And, and other people, it's, it's much more basic. And it's a little bit like cooking. You know, like some people have a really elaborate Thanksgiving and some people have a very basic out of the box. Uh, literally out of the box, out of the Stouffer's box, kind of do it yourself. So I want to honor where you're coming from, and I, I'll go through some ideas of 10, uh, t 10 ways you can get started and engage it for yourself. Um, and I want to leave enough time in the, in the end uh, to get your questions so I can customize it. Are you the, I'm buying a backhoe to dig my foundation kind of do it yourself, or, or am I, I'm standing in the aisle of the hardware store, what can I buy for $10 that'll move me ahead? Um, so I have, I have a list of things that I, that I chose uh, based on, you know, more of the easy side of things. Um, and the first step is education and assessment of your own home. And, uh, you know, one way you can get started, a lot of companies, I, I know John Riley, uh, and many other companies, Evergreen Home Performance, my company, we're always hiring. So we can teach you everything you need to know to do it yourself in your own home and you can borrow our equipment. But if you are looking for a career, this is an important effort we are doing to weatherize all the homes in Maine. So that could be an option or for, for people you know. You know, this is a viable career to learn how to do this. It's very, very, very important. And you could also start a weatherization business. And that's what happened to me. I bought a house that was no insulation. I researched how do I do it myself, because I'm the, the great, great grandchild and the grandchild and the, and the son of do-it-yourselfers. And my, my, my grandmother and my grand, you know, everything they did themselves. So you could start it. Now's a great time to start a weatherization company. There's not there's plenty of work for all of us. So you could consider that, but assuming that you're not, <laughs> you, could, you could read a book. And this is one of the best I've found, and maybe, maybe Claire and, and John have some others. Uh, I, I had this book way back, you know, 15 years ago, and it's been updated. Um, but if you do want to do some things, this is a good reference. It's not that expensive. You can get it on uh, your favorite retailer, uh, if it's Amazon or, or some local, you know, go to your local bookstore and order it through them. Um, but this is a great, uh, th this is a great book by Bruce H Harley, and it will help walk you through. So if, if you're trying to remember from your notes or what have you what to do, um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is valuable information. Bruce really knows what he's doing. Um, my great-grandmother arrived from Sweden, and there's a lot she didn't know, but she had a saying, if you can read, you can do anything. Well, now if you can go to YouTube, you can do anything. <laughs> and, and I actually came up with a list, and you can write this down, shorturl.at slash dht capital D7. Um, or, or, I, or, or you can meet me afterwards and I can email that link. Um, it's really hard to recommend things wholeheartedly from the internet because each one of these videos are amongst the best that I've seen. Each one of them like, oh, I'd probably do it this way or that way, but you know, there's many ways of, of, of doing a certain thing. Each, each person has their slightly different recipe, but I do have a playlist if you wanna 
kind of get inspired on some things that you can do. Um, but really, the most important thing is to, is to do, do an assessment. And the most important thing you can do, if you have the funds to do so, is hire a professional to do an energy audit for you. Because there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of things. It's like, like playing chess the first time. You're like, oh, if I move the rook this way, what happened? You know, you, you have to be thinking a couple of steps ahead because there's a lot of things moving on. And I think Claire and John did a great job kind of explaining some of that. Um, but it's still possible to do some small things and, uh, and still move ahead. But there are a lot of moving parts. Um, but if you, if you can't, uh, or they're not available, you know, you can also do your own assessment. Today is a great day, or last night, or first thing this morning, or last night, to go around and feel where it's cold. You know, it can help, help guide you. You can also look at your roof. The proof is on the roof. If you have these big icicles, or you have these melt spots, or if you go up in your attic um, first thing this morning or, or during this cold weekend and see moisture or frost sticking up there can give you clues of what's going on. You might not know exactly what to do, but it, it'll, it'll help you find, find opportunities. Uh, you can find the drafts. Well, one thing that I discovered is in doing a lot of blower door tests, people leave their windows open inadvertently because their son or so opened the window because he was hot on a really cold day, you know? <laughs> and the window's not latched. You know, you can go around and make sure your windows are all closed, make sure all your storm windows are in place, uh, and try to find big holes in the attic and basement. And this is where the do-it-yourself to safely get up into your attic or to safely be in your basement, there's all sorts of things to look out for, so gauge your own ability to get up there and safely maneuver, have respiratory protection so you're not inhaling potential mold spores or asbestos. I don't want to scare you, but he don't be overconfident in areas that you may, you may not know. But the most important thing, if you can, hire, hire either a company uh, that does an independent energy audit, or uh, many companies like ours, you know, I was raised as a do-it-yourselfer. There are some things that you want to hire help for and other things you want to do yourself. You know, I think most companies that even do the work will say, hey, you want a list of do-it-yourself stuff? Tell me what you're interested in doing, and you can have a whole list. Here, you can work on this stuff, and we'll do this big stuff. And I won't go over a lot of these uh, building science things because Claire and John did a great job with it, but you gotta understand how air moves through the building. Indoor air quality, if this is your crawl space and the heat going through the ductwork there is not quite warm, there's a, there's a lot going on. It could be overwhelming. What do I, what do, I do with that myself? That, that can be overwhelming. Crawling around attics, you can find lots of air leaks where warm air is leaving. Uh, today, you'll feel the warm air blowing your hair back uh, from up in the attic, but you have to safely go up there. So if you're comfortable to safely go up into that, you can, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if you wouldn't feel safe. Um, these are air leaks at the tops of walls, and this is the kind of thing you can seal with foam if you are safely able to navigate. This is the, uh, it doesn't really come out because of the, the lighting, but that's a bulkhead door. You've seen a lot of those those pictures and because those hatch covers or sometimes it's the, the, the garage on the other side of it, those are big intake points. This is actually a house, I think, in, in Freeport. You know, if there's active water, mitigating the water is, is an important first step and that's that's that could be a do-it-yourself activity it's really important to make sure that your house doesn't turn into compost you know composting is green but not if it's your house but one of the first things you can do is weather stripping weather stripping might be included in that packet or or you can find it in the hardware store but often uh doors uh, d doors, they wear out. Or if you have a cat that likes to scratch out the bottom of it, or it starts getting brittle after a few, few years, you can replace the weather stripping in the door. And I will warn you though, weather stripping can be very frustrating. 
especially if you're retrofitting, wet, uh, uh, weather stripping up against the door, you have, to, you have to do it in such a way that you can actually close the door afterwards uh, and not have it like a shuttle door and out of space where you, know, you, you have a five minute process to close the door. Um, but one of the easiest things to do is just to replace that squiggly part right here. That just pops right out, and you can replace it with Q-Lon weather stripping, it's called. And if you find a small local hardware store, usually they have people that can advise you on how to do that, or bring in a sample of the old or the picture. Try to find someone that can help you, uh, help you do it. But it definitely is something that is quite approachable to be able to pull that out and replace it. Uh, another is uh, window and door caulking. Um, if you have existing windows, you know, it could, it could be 100 and 150 year old windows, it could be windows that were uh, made in the 70s or 80s. Um, there's a lot of temporary stuff that Mainers have a long tradition of doing with older windows just to seal up. And if you can get reversible caulking, like the uh, the weather seal, the, uh, the, the rope caulk it's called, and you can kind of make it like putty and stick it in. Uh, if you don't have it in the budget to replace your windows, you know, you can do a pretty good job sealing them up by simply uh, doing some of that sealing with a reversible caulk. There are caulks out there called peel and seal, and it's a reversible caulking that can seal it up quite well, and you can reverse it. Peel and seal is particularly nice for basement windows because you can seal that up quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, foam, all those cracks in your basement with cold air coming in, uh, cracks in the attic, if you can safely get up there, the foam guns do a great job. And uh, the only thing that I will caution you though is don't use foam when you should use caulk. Foam are for big cracks. They're not magical. It's very hard to caulk a seam with foam, unless you're a cake decorator, and I, I have done a little cake decorating. And y y it has to be done you know, very, very, very carefully. It's meant to fill a crack. Um, so, so if you have holes, uh, ho holes that, are, that are gaps, that you can actually squeeze the foam into the gap, then it works well. If it's too small to squeeze it in, then you use caulk. That's what caulk is for. Um, and it can be very frustrating to use, and it can be dangerous. Like if you're sealing holes above your head and that foam gets in your eye, that's not good. You need to wear safety protection. But it's a very, uh, you know, the professional weatherization crews are doing a lot of this in attics and basements. But again, my biggest caution to you is um, don't use foam if you can use caulk. And they do make guns that, that can make it more cost effective for, to use, for, for you to use cans. Now, window dressers is in the back of the room here. Now, there's a tradition of using plastic over the windows, and window dressers is way ahead of that. And that is the interior storm window that goes into, into the space, and it's reusable year after year. Um, that's, I, I don't know if people can volunteer their time to help others, and maybe, and maybe you can talk to them uh, about, about uh, window dressers, but it's an amazing initiative, and it's super, super cost effective, really helps comfort, and, uh, and helps you work with your existing windows. Um, if you're in a pinch because you can't quite uh, get involved with the, with the effort, you know, these, these window insulators um, with the shrink wrap is, is certainly possible. Um, it, it's kind of messy because you have to get that adhesive off each year and that kind of stuff. Um, but a window treatment does have a huge, huge benefit. You can also use some uh, insulated shades, everything from quilts, uh, which, w which a lot of people have made themselves, um, and also the, uh, uh, the honeycomb shades uh, help, help add a layer, but it doesn't air seal, it's mostly an insulation layer. These can air seal, but the window dressers, uh, window in interior storms are excellent. 
Um, one thing about deciding where to insulate is if you find the biggest temperature differences in your house from warm to cold that has no insulation on it, you can have the biggest impact. If you have a little bit of insulation, you can go from a little bit to a lot, but if you go from nothing to something or nothing to a lot, that has a much, much bigger impact. Think of it, if I were to go outside, that first shirt has a bigger impact than the second shirt, <laughs> right? So uh, if you go down to the basement, if it's a cold basement and you are using a hydronic heating system uh, with hot water or even steam, Insulating those pipes, it's super effective. If you're not needing the heat in the basement, it's spilling out inadvertently, especially if you have steam. And that's a quite approachable way of making sure that all the heat that is in that water or in that steam makes it to where you're asking for it in the house. So that's, that's a leverage point. That's fairly do-it-yourself. Just don't bump your head. Um, I will caution you though, if you have steam pipes, it very well could have asbestos on it. So you have to be very, very careful. You don't want to mess around with it. If it has asbestos, you need to have that treated. But oftentimes it's all been removed and it's not insulated. And boy, the basement's so warm. But if you had a thermostat in the basement, you might turn it down and turn it up in your house. Uh, insulating those steam pipes are, uh, are super, super effective. But again, you'll want to talk to people that know um, to help you. And some of the playlist information that I, that I included talks about that pipe insulation. Now, one thing I will say, though, is a lot of people are switching to heat pumps, which is a good thing. They're super efficient. It get, gets rid of those distribution losses, you know, the, all those runs of pipes. So if you're using your heating system as a backup and it only comes on like this morning, <laughs> because the heat pump handles it most of the time, maybe that's not your most cost-effective way of devoting your effort, because if it's rarely coming on because the heat pump is taking the load, then you might not want to heat, heat, uh, do, do, the, do the heating pipes. Um, so it depends on your particular house. Another thing is if you have ductwork, there's a lot of older houses that have uninsulated ductwork running through the basement, and that's even worse, because you have all that sheet metal that is just radiating heat into the basement. And if you're not down there warming yourself up against that, that sheet metal, this is a very do-it-yourself friendly project. However, there can be asbestos tape involved on some of these seams. So again, you have to, you have to be cautious. It looks, looks like a, a gray to off-white. Uh, it's not duct tape, it looks more fibrous. Um, so if you, if you see that, you probably don't want to do this treatment, but if it's completely bare, you can use a water-based duct sealant, which you can get at hardware stores or the big box stores, and goop it on. It's kind of fun. You can get a rubber glove and a cotton glove over it, and you can just goop it on with your hands, or you can paint brush it on. But what that does is it keeps all that warm air in the ducts and coming out of the registers, and I have a few YouTube videos in my playlist that talks about how to do that. And once you do have it sealed up, then you can insulate it with the duct insulation. That makes a big impact. But again, if you are switching to heat pumps and that's only a backup, it's not, it's not as big of a priority. But there are heat pumps more and more that you can connect to an existing ductwork system. So if you're going to have a heat pump delivering heat through existing duct works, then it makes more sense. But this is why it's really important to maybe get some advice from an energy auditor to help you navigate all these choices because you could be insulating the wrong thing. Um, attic hatches. So this is a little bit more advanced. You have to do a little bit of carpentry. Um, and we saw some beautiful attic hatches. John had, had some uh, fabricated out of you know wood and, and, and insulation and weather stripping and caulking. Um, and that's definitely within the wheelhouse of many of us that might have carpentry skills. Um, if you don't want to get to that level, uh, the next best thing for like a attic access with a pull down stairs, those are hugely leaky. Um, there is something called an attic tent that you can buy. 
It's not as well insulated, but at least it really helps you triage it a bit more. And it's a little bit like a zippered up coat. And you can just buy this, I think it's maybe $150 or so, and there's instructions on how you staple it and caulk it and seal it in place, and then you can zip that up. Um, it is very nice to have that kind of custom fabricated um, hatch that, that John showed in his slideshow. But if you can't, that's a possibility. And then, and then finally, just insulating and air sealing with uh, weather stripping an attic hatch. You know, often attic hatches are just very poorly put, put together. But how, how can it go all these years of being poorly put together in, in your master bedroom closet or whatever? It doesn't feel cold in there, what's the problem? Well, the problem is warm air rises. And the warm air is going into your closet all the time to go up into the attic. So because it's leaving, it doesn't draw attention to itself. But that front door, every time you walk through, it's like, oh, that weather stripping's terrible. Oh, these windows are terrible. I'm going to replace my windows. When it could just be the attic hatch needs your love. And you need to go up there because that's where the heat is leaving. All right, I think we're getting close to the end here. So now we have a chimney chase. This one isn't quite big enough for John to jump into. Um, but there are a lot of chimney chases, and this is more advanced. You need to safely be able to get up into your attic. Um, but if you pull back insulation and you see down around the chimney, this is a particularly big one. Sometimes it's a smaller crack. Um, you can use 26 gauge sheet metal and use a fire rated fire block caulking up against the chimney. And then from here, you can use plywood, I'd probably suggest, um, to, to block off the rest of the hole. So doing a chimney chase, more advanced, but it's, it has a big, big, big impact. And similarly in the basement, this is looking up from the basement level. It's been a big, uh, a, a big chimney chase from the bottom. Sometimes you have air flowing from the basement all the way up into the attic. You can do a similar treatment down in the, in the basement, but not all houses have this. If you just look in and you see it's pretty tight and sealed, it's probably not as big of an opportunity. Or the energy auditor that you may hire can help guide you on, yeah, this chimney chase isn't bad, or this one's is huge, you could jump in there. Uh, one final thing, don't use foam against the chimney. And there's so-called fire rated or fire blocking foam, that's not designed to be used against the chimney. That's only designed to seal the tops of walls for uh, plumbing and electrical penetrations in case fire gets in the, into, the, uh, into the wall. It's not designed to go up against a chimney. I'm, I always cringe when I see that bright orange fire blocking foam sprayed all over masonry. Not, not a good plan. All right, my final one is this basement door or, or the lack thereof. And really a door, an exterior grade door um, that's in progress, that's not sealed in place, but you need to make sure it's all sealed around, around the edges. Um, that, that's a really good plan, especially if you have your bulkhead connecting directly to your garage, because your garage has cars that emit exhaust, and exhaust has carbon monoxide in it. And that whole garage wall and that whole you know, basement, you could have Every time you know, the, the, the car pulls out, all this carbon monoxide comes straight into your basement, right into your house. So it's really important to have that separation. Or if it's just a bulkhead, it's a very leaky, leaky area. It's very cold. If you're not comfortable putting in a door or you're just trying to get by through the winter, you know, a piece of rigid foam could do. Um, maybe not the pink board, but maybe a, a foil-faced. Uh, board, and if you can frame it out or have something for it to go into um, and, and, uh, and put it in place, you could seal that. Sometimes you can use the, uh, the, foil, uh, the, the foil tape. Um, that's easily cut, but you can use that foil tape around the edges to seal that in place temporarily. Um, that's, that's kind of a triage kind of measure. But it's best if you had a hatch that had weather stripping and had, had some sort of latch to help close it. Um, but closing that is a huge, huge potential opportunity. So 
Those are 10 potential do-it-yourself projects. And uh, hopefully that was helpful, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Let, well, we're going to be breaking for half an hour after this so that you can talk to some of the presenters and some of the people tables, but we'll take a couple quick questions. Sir. Sorry. Do you have any comments about how to keep heat going up chimneys through the openings and fireplaces um, that just have the damper? Yep. Um, do you, well, would you be using the fireplace regularly or not so regularly? Both. Both. Yep. It, it is tricky, and fireplaces are very comforting from a visual standpoint while the fire is going, but it is a huge hole uh, that has a direct, uh, direct shot out. And um, you know, the tough part is, is while, while the coals are still, uh, still going through a cycle and becoming cold, you, you really can't close it. So that, that, that's part of the penalty. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just something you got to deal with. Just like my dog needs to go outside every five minutes for some reason. <laughs> and I love my dog, but you know, so you lose energy. But if you're not going to use it for a while or if you have it during the holidays, um, even the best dampers don't seal that well. Um, so it's tough. You know, that there are that there is something called a chimney balloon. If you Google it, it's a custom fit balloon that you blow up that goes up there and something hanging down to remind you that it's there so you can take it out. Otherwise you're gonna fill your house full of smoke. But it is it's a weak point of of fireplaces and energy efficiency. And uh, there are a lot of stoves that are a lot, a lot more energy efficient, a lot more airtight. But if you have an old fashioned fireplace, you know, without that chimney balloon, it's kind of tough. Or you can also, if it's a fireplace in a historical home that you don't want to get rid of, but it's not safe to use because the chimney's not, you know, you can totally block it with, with sheet metal and seal it all up and it, it's not reversible very easily, um, but that intermittent use, especially for the holidays or, you know, for a date with your significant other in the living room, you know, that, that's, that, that's hard. It's hard to have both. Yeah. Other questions? For Richard. Yes. Well, we'll give the microphone to you. Oh, yeah. Well, just to piggyback onto that question, I have a, I just got a, a wood stove installed in my fireplace, and I'm kind of thinking about how do I seal around the wood stove line, I got a liner up the chimney because the chimney isn't good anymore, and, and I'm trying to seal around that. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, and that, that can be tough. Uh, often, fire safety trumps efficiency there. You know, you'd rather not burn your house down, uh, then have an efficient house. <laughs> and um, it, can, it, it can be a little bit tricky, to, to be honest. Each individual case, and I, I strongly recommend working with someone, or if you're that advanced, do it yourself, or um, do the research, maybe talk to the, the fire department about some of your creative ideas, but a stove shop might be able to, to help you with something with sheet metal and some sort of fire block caulking uh, for that penetration, but it is tough. I've seen a lot of terrible things from like nothing blocking it to a bunch of uh, some sort of fibrous insulation stuffed in there. Um, and it, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Wow. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Wait for the mic. Here it comes. For those of us who still are very dependent upon wood stoves uh, as a backup, um, we always have a pot of water sitting on top of the wood stove. Otherwise, it just feels so terribly dry. Now, having heard the previous presentation about moisture, I'm thinking that's like a huge mistake, except comfort-wise, having some moisture in the air in the kitchen seems good. Is that a big mistake? Um, it's a really great question. If 
ho hopefully you all, you all heard it, and I grew up with wood as primary heat in my house, and there was always a kettle of water uh, on to, to, to get the humidity going. And you know, if you do have concentrated leaks all coming from one spot up into an attic up on a roof, you can, you can get condensation and, and mold. And one thing you can do to check is you can go up into your attic today, <laughs> or if the sun's not shining out at night, you can see if there's frost up there and see how bad it is. In some ways, because old houses leak everywhere, it spreads out and it's made out of whole wood that wasn't just saplings. Um, newer houses, in a lot of ways, are more sensitive to moisture damage um, because they're made out of pre-processed wood products um, and the leaks tend to be concentrated in a few uh, major um, faults. So if you have all your moisture coming through one hole, it could be totally ruined, whereas in an old house, it's going everywhere. So it has a chance to kind of uh, go everywhere, but it is tricky, it is tricky. Um, if, if your windows are fogging up in your main living area, um, from the moisture, you, your humidity may be too high. And, and so if it's not, it's, it's going somewhere. And, um, and so if, you're, if your attic is not full of mold, your house has figured out a way to relieve it. But this is what makes it tricky. As you start decreasing air leakage, there's so many homes that, uh, that uh, have gotten a big treatment that dramatically cut their air leakage and they're used to humidifying, whether it's on the wood stove, a pot of water, or a humidifier, and they over-humidify the house thinking they always do it, but actually their house doesn't leak as much, so it doesn't become as dry in the winter. But this is one of the, one of the complex ways of working with a house, especially as you start changing things. Could I follow up question there? Thank you. Um, this is something I've been thinking about at my own home. I found that the humidity level is 30%, and what I think I've read is allowable in a house or safe, and some of the professionals here might be able to help me out with this, but is 40 to 60% humidity is okay. And so if we were to add a pot of water to the top of our wood stove and we stayed within that 40 to 60% range, would that be okay if we didn't notice anything else happening bad? Well, the better insulated your house, the more you can safely have a higher humidity, but I think 60 is way too high, because 60 will grow mold on your leather goods and jackets and your closets that might be a little bit cold. And even 50 could get close to that if that closet is cold, because then um, that percentage humidity, what's 50 in the house where it's warm could be 80% in that closet and then everything is covered with mold. So is, if, it, is it okay to bring it up to 40? Uh, 40, Because right yeah. now it's like a desert at my house. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's tough, yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, in my house, it's not super tight, so I don't use the bathroom fan in midwinter, but I'm, I'm noticing I'm at 25%, and I have a piano in my house that I don't want to have the soundboard crack. So, but, but definitely it's, it's riskier as you get above 45 and 50. It depends on what the weakest link, and the weakest link could be that cold closet in the guest bedroom that is turned way down. Everything could turn to mold in that room because the percentage humidity is like 80%. So if you get a couple of, of those uh, hygrometers showing you the percent, put one in your weakest point, your cold bedroom closet, and see what that is. All right. Is there, a, is there a target number like that's good for a house or safe? Well, we love it if it's 50 for our breathing. The house loves it if it's 30 or 35, but it depends on your wood finishes too, or if you have a piano or a Stradivarius violin or something that, you know. I'll throw you, them away. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's hard. Yeah. You're threading the, the needle but between right. many different needs. I'll miss my violin. One more question. What do you got, sir? Very quickly, Richard, thank you for the shout out for window dressers. Um, people who don't know about us should know that we're sort of halfway between a contractor and a do-it-yourself because we meet in a 
a large room, uh, a dozen people, uh, different volunteers at different shifts, and we put together these things um, with materials, tools, and jigs all supplied by a nonprofit. So uh, we're here, and I just wanted to give myself a commercial for that. Thanks. <laughs> I agree. It's it, it's a way of getting getting help to 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 do it yourself. Richard, thank you very much. You. So our speakers that have already spoken will be here for the next half hour to answer more of your questions. We also have some people who have yet to speak who would also love to talk with you. Somebody from Efficiency Maine, Passive House. Freeport Can is here as well, so please take some time, take a break, get some coffee, and uh, we'll see you in 30 minutes. Thank you. All right, I hope that uh, you had a good, uh, a good break time and got to get some of your answers, so got to get some answers to your questions. Um, there'll be more time at the end as well to, to chat with some of these folks. Um, you've probably already seen that Efficiency Maine is here and they're, they're about to join us for some uh, information. I just also want to remind you that we are hoping to raise money for Freeze Out today. We are doing very well with the fundraising. Um, and if you weren't here in the beginning, I'd also like to announce that if you haven't made a donation to uh, FCS freeze out yet for the fuel fund from 12 o'clock until 2 o'clock there will be a uh, matching a donation matching if you make a donation up to hundred dollars Kennebec Savings Bank will match that donation so but that donation has to be made from 12 to 2 at Bow Street Market so if you have a quarter in your pocket it turns into 50 cents will they take cards? they'll take anything yeah, there's, there's actually, and you can see it around here as well, there is a QR code. We all learned about QR codes today. There is a QR code on the, um, on the signage and on the little sheets that are, are mentioning freeze out. And if you scan that QR code, it'll bring you right to the GoFundMe so that you can use a credit card. All right. In this next section, uh, we, we, to begin with, we, oh, we're having some technical difficulties, huh? Oh, good, okay. Let's pay no attention to the people behind the curtain. Um, so we've talked about the home as a system, right? Thanks to our, our first speakers. Richard Burbank was here from Evergreen, giving us some of his insider tips to DIY, which was really cool to have somebody in that capacity who gets paid for that to come out here and share that with us. That's always really exciting to me. Um, and I'm grateful for, for Richard sharing those secrets with us. Um, now we're gonna talk about ways to pay for it. There are uh, government funds available to help with some of these projects. Some of them are loans, some of them are rebates, some of them are tax credits, and some of them are straight up free money. And so in this, in this final section, we're gonna learn about some of those opportunities that you have. Um, it's a good thing I brought Moby Dick with me do a little reading. Um, so we're gonna have uh, two speakers for you. Uh, Bob Stevens, who's been active in Freeport, having served on the Town Council and Planning Board and Freeport Community Services and the Freeport Conservation Trust Boards. He does not sleep. His law practice involved real estate work on electricity production and transmission, including hydro and solar energy. He serves on the steering committee of Freeport Climate Action Now and, uh, and he's gonna share with us some things as well. And then we have uh, Bridget Gifford, who has worked with Efficiency Maine for six years, focusing on low-income initiatives. She has worked in New York, and we won't hold that against her, and Maine with efficiency programs and utility providers. Efficiency Maine is a public benefits fund for energy efficiency programs, and it provides rebates designed to help to, designed to save Maine people money on weatherization, efficiency, heating, and the purchase of electric vehicles. Um, and so now I'd like to turn it over to these two to share what they have brought. Thank you very much for being here. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, so 
I feel like I have the best job in the whole state. I get to just write checks and help people do efficiency projects. It's really an honor to work with Efficiency Maine. Um, my presentation is going to mostly about be about those enhanced rebates for low and moderate income Mainers, but we have rebates for everyone. We have rebates for you know a millionaire who wants to do an efficiency project. So I'll go into a little bit of detail about that, but the presentation's predominantly just geared for low and moderate income Mainers, and, and what does that mean? I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so what is Efficiency mean? We are essentially a state agency, and we run the efficiency programs for the state of Maine. Every state in the nation has an efficiency program. Those are mostly run through those state's utility offices, and in Maine, we do it a little differently. A few states do it differently, and we feel like we do it a little bit better. So um, we, are, we have a lot of different buckets of funding. Some are through ratepayers, and some are regional greenhouse gas initiative funds. But that's a complication on the back end. To the residents of Maine, it is just a rebate check to you for doing an efficiency project. Um, this is totally separate from Efficiency Maine. This is the federal government. These are tax credits for 2023. There's some changes, um, and I wanted to just highlight those here in a summary table just to help you understand there are rebates through the state of Maine to help you, um, you know, compel you to go with the highest efficiency possible. But then there's also money at the federal level in April when you file your taxes that will also help contribute to that cost that you've got. So just a moment there to absorb some, uh, this is all on our website too. All of this information that I'm going through today is, is on our website. Oopsie, oopsie. So this is really what we do. We do these four things. We write checks, that's our, our um, most of our work, we offer rebates to Mainers. We have a database of installers. These are independent contractors throughout the state of Maine um, that do the work. The contractors are listed on our website in the form of a database. You plug in what your interested category is, a heat pump or insulation, your, your zip code, and it will populate the distance from your zip code and show you everyone who is partnered with Efficiency Maine. So it's just a handy tool to help you navigate the process. Uh, we have financing for low and moderate income Mainers in the form of an energy efficiency loan. So to help cover that delta, what is the project cost? What is the rebate? And then there's this remaining copay. Um, and so for that remaining copay for low and moderate income Mainers, there is a, a loan product available so they can just you know, take that at little bits monthly. Um, and then we have tools on our website um, all sorts of calculators and specific tools to help you understand um, you know, what your costs are and what the benefits might be to this efficiency project that you're going to undertake. Um, this next slide is sort of our problem statement. Um, this is every which way to heat your home. These are all the primary fuels that we normally come across and what those costs are for a typical main home over the course of a year. And typical main home, we're talking about 2,000 square foot home over the course of a year in Maine. So these values are taken from the governor's energy office. What are the, what's the pricing at this point in time? The point in time that these were taken is uh, February 13th. As we know, things have been volatile. So um, if it's tough to see in the back, that's why we've got the, the big um, headers there. So you can see the heat pump cost over the course of a year as opposed to a propane cost over the course of a year. So this is sort of, um, you can see where you are in this continuum and where you might want to land. Now when you go to our website, this is our homepage, this is what you're going to see. Um, there's a ton of information here. I want to just draw your attention to the options for low income households and then it says click here for details. Um, so that's going to take you to all the enhanced rebates that we offer to low and moderate income Mainers. There's also that federal funding button that we're updating constantly as more information becomes available about new federal funding. Um, that's where you're also going to find the tax credit information that I mentioned. Um, 
We have rebates for small businesses, large businesses, industrial, any facility type in the state of Maine is eligible for an efficiency rebate. So if you yourself are a business owner or a landlord, um, please visit our website for those details. For low and moderate income Mainers, when you go to this button, you're going to um, find this income-based eligibility verification. So um, you yourself are attesting your low income efficiency main needs to verify that that in indeed is the case in order to pay out that enhanced rebate. Um, so you're gonna go to this page. Home energy assistance program is one pathway. Um, food assistance or cash assistance and main care, those are all pathways that are going to get a homeowner the largest rebate available. And whether you yourself benefit from any of these programs or maybe your neighbor or a family member, please spread the word. Um, those pathways will uh, get you an electric vehicle for I think our present uh, rebate for electric vehicles for those pathways is $7,500, which is quite a bit. Um, a heat pump for a $2,000 rebate off a heat pump. A water heater completely free. Efficiency Maine will have a plumber come install that for you, given other qualifying criteria like a basement. And insulation. So for those four pathways of benefit assistance, if you receive that, Efficiency Maine's rebate will be $8,000. So at 80 percent of your project cost, up to $8,000 Efficiency Maine will contribute. Um, below there are the moderate income pathways. Your tax assessed valuation is quite low, or your adjusted gross income on your taxes. If you're a single filer, you're making no more than $70,000. And if you're a joint filer, you're making no more than $100,000. So for those pathways, that's the moderate income manner. Um, and those rebates are still enhanced, but um, not as much as the benefit assistance pathways. So just a little bit about what does it mean to be low and moderate income. This is what we're talking about. So if you click through there, you're going to find this page. This is just an example. You're just going to pop in your information here and hit submit. Efficiency Main is going to interface with um, DHHS or those other entities to verify. Once we verify that indeed you are um, low or moderate income main Mainer, uh, we will send you a letter. And this is just sort of a sample that you are eligible for these enhancements. It'll give you a table of exactly what we're talking about. Um, there's a little verification number at the top there. If you're interested in a loan, you want to plug that number into your loan application. Um, but this letter is important. You're going to get it in an email and snail mail. Um, and we'll also have a copy in case it gets lost. Um, but this is going to be good for a year. And you can sort of plan your efficiency project accordingly. Your installer will want to see this also, just to, to be sure that you're, in fact, eligible. OK, so how to get a rebate. Um, you're going to go through that pre-qualification process. If you're low and moderate income, you want to just get that letter first in hand. After that, you're going to um, call one of those installers. And I'm going to show you how to get access to that tool. Um, and you're going to get some quotes. You're going to apply for a loan if, in fact, you wanted to um, capture a loan for that efficiency project. You're going to schedule and complete the job. Your installer is going to submit all the paperwork. You would have to sign the claim form. Um, but your installer is going to do a lot of this heavy lifting. They're going to, you know, if you're interested in a loan, they're going to have to get that scope of work approved. That's all on the installer. That's not on the customer. Um, and then the installer is going to receive the payment. So the low-income customer isn't you know, going to front the full amount and then get reimbursed later, um, the low-income customer is only going to pay that delta, that copay, and the rest of the rebate's going right to the installer. So it's sort of like an instant discount. This is how to find those installers um, on our website. 
This is our installer database. Um, it's got a services button. It's got a, it's a, there's a drop down there and you're gonna plug in heat pump and then populate from your zip code and it'll search. We'll um, populate everyone in the database who's done the most work for Efficiency Main first. So they've all been vetted, they've all got their credentials and their insurance, um, but they will populate in your list by those contractors who've done the most rebates for Efficiency Main. So it's just another um, sort of check there. Um, you can be rest assured those at the top of the list are, 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 are eagle installers, we call them. Um, Okay, so here's just a little bit of information about the rebates themselves. Our heat pump rebate is wildly popular, um, saves money, increases year-round comfort. We're heating, we're using AC and dehumidification. Um, there's, a, there's an air quality aspect to them. And just as an aside, that really severe cold snap we had a couple of weeks back, the homeowners, um, who have heat pumps solely in their homes, no combustion systems whatsoever, had reported you know, their heat pumps worked really, really well, even at that sub-zero um, temperature. So um, we're all in on heat pumps. We're pushing them every year um, for low and moderate income manners. So that's you know, a low in income household on a list, or that adjusted gross income is a little bit more um, favorable. Either of those categories are going to get a $2,000 rebate for a heat pump. This is something that needs to be installed by a professional. It's not a DIY, OK? Uh, here's just a, a savings example. So typically, uh, when we were crunching the numbers and, and seeing what does one of these cost, um, it's around $4,600. For our low income meters, it tends to be a little less than that. Um, but here's just an example, you know, when you apply the rebate, what is that net cost? What is that delta? You can put that onto a loan product or um, find some other funding to help offset that cost that Bob's gonna talk about in a moment um, and the payback period there. Oopsie, I skipped a slide. Okay, so insulation, we've heard a lot about insulation this morning. Um, we have the, um, Rebate for insulation for our low-income mainers is 80% of the project cost, up to $8,000. As I mentioned, this is really just geared for low income, but the moderate-income mainers have a 60% rebate, up to $6,000, so if you fall into that category. Um, and then everyone else also is eligible for a rebate, um, and that would be, for insulation, a 40% rebate through Efficiency Main, up to $4,000. Again, this is not a DIY kind of rebate. This is using a professional like the folks we heard from this morning. And here's just the same kind of savings example with the payback period um, and what that looks like. Typically, what we're seeing for insulation projects are around $6,800. That's the average. It's you know a, a nice attic and basement job. Okay, our home energy loans, these are available to low and moderate income mainers to help offset um, you know, the, the initial cost there and to have some bite-sized payments every month. And typically, um, you know, you're saving as much energy as you are paying per month. And this is just what that loan application looks like. And you can get to this through the website again. Um, if you're interested in a loan product, you want to get that letter, that pre-qualification letter from Efficiency Main, because in the corner there was that code. And in order to access this form, you're going to need that code. Um, we have a lot of tools on our website, and this is just one of them. This is an efficiency calculator. This is going to um, give you sort of an idea of if you need to call someone um, like Richard Burbank this morning, um, you're gonna plug in your own square footage for your home and all of your consumption information that you can find. So how many gallons of oil did you burn last year? How many cords of wood did you burn? And all of those things. And then you're gonna click calculate and you'll see 
you know, how tight is my building envelope? Is this a normal um, amount of consumption given the square footage of my home? So it'll give you a quick idea of what is normal and um, whether you might need an intervention uh, from one of our insulation professionals. There's lots of other uh, tools on our website too. This, I just like to put this up again because it's one of my favorites. Um, but we've got another slide doing the, the same graph looking only at water heating. So this is the same kind of thing, all the different ways you can heat your hot water um, and what is the most efficient. So again, this is over the course of a year. This is a family of four, typical water consumption and uh, where you might fall on that continuum and where you might want to be. And that's it for me. So the efficiencymain.com website has everything we talked about and much, much more. Um, again, there's a lot of information for um, small businesses and industrial. We have an 866 number. This is staffed in uh, Brunswick, right up the street. And they're available Monday through Friday to answer any questions. So if you're finding there's too much information on our website, you just want to call and talk to somebody and just ask a question. They're waiting. They can connect you to me if you want to just call me and say hello. Um, but any information you need, I'm here for the rest of today. Or this 866 number is, is what you need. There, there was some pretty technical stuff in there, and I wonder if, if anybody wants to take just a moment to, would you mind answering questions Absolutely, right now? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's, let's do that. Let's see if I can uh, phrase this the way that I'm, it's kind of, you know, fresh swirling around in my head. Um, so it seems like, you know, maybe, is, is there, so I've heard of on-bill financing, and let's mm -hmm. start there, because um, you said that uh, typically the, the payment for the loan would be um, about what your energy cost savings is, but maybe it's not um, always the same. Is there a way that it could be, like, instead of having a separate payment, have it just be baked into your utility bill? And then taking that a step further, um, could we uh, have the utilities actually talk to each other or talk to you guys? And I know this would be like a legislative thing, so it's probably like above everybody. But um, and and even even determine which households are those, like, and and somehow incentivize the. Um, filling out that kind of yeah. like how much oil per year oh oh yeah and then mm -hmm. and then target the the you know which houses are we going to hit first based on what's going to give us our biggest bang for the buck because we need to do this to every house in the state essentially yeah um yeah so the question is just around cooperation with the utilities um We'd love that. We'd love that. We do um, communicate quite a bit and, um, you know, crunch some, some usage data um, in general, but that would be a PUC kind of um, function. Yeah. I wondered if you could differentiate between tax credits and rebates. Yeah. And I, I believe from what I just saw that the, it's the feds that are doing the credits, tax credits, and you're doing the rebates. Is that, that right? It's a great question. And um, yeah, so the efficiency main rebate check is pretty immediate. You're going to do an efficiency project, and you're eligible for a check in the mail to you or to your installer. For low income, it always goes to the installer. But you can, if you're not low income, you can make that decision together. Do I want to pay up front and then receive the check or have this offset my initial cost? That's within six weeks of submission of their claim form. It's a check to you. The federal tax credits 
totally different. That's when you file your taxes in April, and um, that's a much slower process. <laughs> well, so. well, let me do it just to follow up on it. I'm, you're not the federal person, I understand, but I don't have I don't pay that much in taxes. I'm a retired person. Can I have my daughter buy X? Oh, let's let's see a vehicle. She takes the tax credit and loans the car to me and gives Are me you the credit. Are you asking me about tax fraud? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Leave it to Chalmers. <laughs> Yeah. Hammy? Yes. Uh, yeah, your handy chart there giving uh, the cost of uh, oil and and propane, but a lot of people are on natural gas, uh -huh. city gas, and I didn't see that any place, and that was a little frustrating. Okay, it's just hard to see. So the natural gas furnace, um, thank you so much, Vanna. Um, is, is on there. There's also a natural gas boiler over here. Um, so the difference between a boiler and a furnace is one's hot air and one's forced hot water. Um, there's, there's a lot of Maine that doesn't have access to natural gas. Uh, Freeport's not one of those places. Um, but typically, when we do presentations, it's, it's not an option for people. Um, but Thank you. Will, will you be around for a few minutes afterwards in case there are any other questions about Absolutely. these programs? Yep. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we're good to go. I would now like to introduce again Mr. Bob Stevens, who's going to share with us some of his knowledge about some of the money available to us locally. Is that correct, Mr. Stevens? That is correct as soon as your wife, Kate, sets up <laughs> My wife. the video because I'm too old to have done it properly. Yeah. yeah, he says that so that Thank we'll you, help Kate. him. It's not true. Um, that little arrow there. Right there. there. Okay, good. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Take you. it Thank away, you. Bob. So the first thing I want to do is thank uh, Bridget Gifford for coming and telling us so much about what is available through Efficiency Maine. And because of what so much is available, the Freeport Town Council, the town of Freeport, said this is something that we would like to be able to add something to for the people in Freeport, sort of a tag along. And I, it couldn't be done without what Efficiency Maine is providing as the basis for it. So right off the top, I wanted to say that and also say that what I'm going to go over now is a bit out of dated because Bridget has told me a few things this morning that I didn't know yesterday. <laughs> They've made some big steps forward, but with your indulgence, I'll press on with what I was going to say, which is to start out with the with Department of Energy, and there's that button there. I do go down, don't I? Okay. Um, or, or that's not right. Okay. All right, good. We have help. Okay, so that that this next sheet lays out some of what Bridget went over. It it uh, summarizes the tax credits that are available through the federal government. It's in a package which is available afterwards. It includes, on the next page, some frequently asked questions. Um, it's a nice thing about it is it covers renters as well as homeowners for almost everything. Back on that previous page was indicated just a few items that aren't available for renters. So that's a plus. And as Bridget said, this credit is obtained by filing with your tax return. I've identified for you the particular form. If you want to know what it is, it's a famous form 5695. And basically, they take the, the IRS 
um, like it does with your tax return, it says, it assumes you're telling the truth, that you in fact have bought something that you're taking a credit for. Um, you can do the credit year after year. There is a limit in a particular year. There's a, um, a great site on the, um, I don't know whether it's DO, I think it's the, uh, the Treasury Department that is at the bottom that answers a lot of questions about, about the credits. So if you want to learn more, um, I recommend you go there. So now we get to, for me anyway, and for Freeport, I believe, is what Freeport has adopted, which is taking some of the American Rescue Plan Act funds and said, let's make them available to help people, low, moderate income people, take advantage of what is available through Efficiency Maine and beyond to do something to reduce their heating costs and help reduce their carbon impact. So we have really initiated today, I guess, for the first day, the inauguration of the program, the Freeport Get Money program. <laughs> and um, in fact, working with um, Jessica Malloy of the town hall, a application has been put together and it's been put online and you can go on freeportmaine.com slash electrify and find that application. You can fill it out on, on, online, print it out, and take it into the town hall and get started in the process. It's as easy as that. It covers not just heat pumps. We heard a lot about this morning about, about weatherization. And for a lot of things, you, you need to hire somebody. But there are a lot of things, like Richard pointed out, we can do ourselves. And I double-checked this with Claire and John after, when they left because I thought, no, they're saying so many things need to be done that are huge. Is it still worthwhile to do little things that we can do? And they say, by all means. So what we've got is some money that the town council agreed ought to be able to go for, for smaller things that people could do themselves, which is weatherization, go to Freeport Hardware, buy the things that you want, you want the, the caulk, the, the insulation, and have your receipt, come back, fill out your application to, in fact, obtain a rebate for the money that you've spent up to $300 if you fall into the 90% of the area median income, which doesn't cover everybody in this room, but it's a way of making available to as many people as we can that probably need this, this help as much as, as they do. Um, just also locally here, I wanted to give a plug for our Royal River heat pumps that are located right here, who are a great uh, fount of knowledge. In fact, I believe the governor's office may have brought um, and Efficiency Maine had brought down representatives from Washington, D.C. to meet at Royal River and, and see how a great uh, rebate uh, contractor works and why it's so effective in the state of Maine. We also have Maine Solar Solutions right here in town, which ta it's taken the way of helping install solar, and they're a great fount of knowledge and information. They actually have some uh, very good loan programs I see by new, new literature too um, that uh, will make it possible for folks to uh, do um, the uh, solar panels and finance them. Um, let's see what else I wanted to cover there. Probably, oh, um, tying in with what Bridget was saying about the uh, qualifications for the Efficiency Main program. Um, that's being one way of uh, tying in for availability. Uh, well, well, one for the low low income rebate is, I think you pointed out they're more like 
the Medicare is the, the one, Bridget, that has the greatest number of uh, recipients? Um, yeah, so a family on main care uh, main would care, qualify. Right. Um, and that's anyone in the household that receives main care. Typically, um, it's the children that qualify and the parents don't, but that's fine. The household would still qualify. So um, what we've discovered is that the LIHEAP list of um, eligible Mainers for heating assistance is about 40,000 Mainers around the state, and then the main care list is about 250,000 households throughout the state. So it's a much larger list, and, and they all qualify. Did you hit that next one for me? Okay. And then we have the application here online, and as you can see, it requires providing contact information, the eligibility, um, the town has spelled out on the application what the 90% uh, of the area median income would be based upon household, so it's easy to see if, in fact, a person will be qualifying for the Freeport program. Um, it also includes a list of the items that are included in the Freeport program. And um, anything in particular about them? Well, there's quite a bit of information that you can pick up from there. You'll end up coming into the town hall with a photo ID, um, proof of residency, a completed W-9 form, which is available on, uh, online. And uh, if for some reason they aren't be available, we'll figure out how to have a number of them in town hall so that they can be uh, filled out right there. The next one is a leap beyond. So we've got, we've got the efficiency main rebates, we've got the uh, Freeport rebates, and then we had, we had the tax credits. There's some other uh, federal programs there that are covered in the IRA, which I think may be particular, one of them anyway, is particular interest to uh, small businesses and farmers here in Freeport which is so-called Rural Energy for America program. And it's available to rural area businesses. And Freeport is a rural area. It's outside of the greater Portland area, and it's considered to be in the rural area. And this would provide, and this was a correction that I believe we made here. Yes, it's 40% of a project cost can be covered by a grant. Um, and I have a bit of more information that's not on the slide. I spent some time with this Katrina Shaw at the USDA, and she's basically the top dog on this program. The grant application goes in. There's a current um, oh, uh, submission period that's ending shortly, March 31, but it it's covers for existing and new buildings where an where applicant lists proposed work when it's, it has to be completed in 12 months of the start, and it provides for reimbursement afterwards of up to 40% of the cost. So that's something that's worth checking out by a, by a number of small businesses. There's also a uh, uh, guarantee program that's there, too, that's made through lenders that are involved in sort of uh, USDA or SBA loans. And what the, the, a small business is, I'm not sure what the definition is, but it's, it's what the Small Business Administration of USDA defines and is set forth in the Main State Code. So we can um, follow up with them and find out more about that. The, uh, Next program that we have information on here is about the federal rebate program that's coming. And I've heard some folks say, as you can look at it, there's going to be terrific rebates here for a lot of people. Um, people are going to be able to qualify as low income up to 80% of the area median income. 
and for, for one level of rebates and uh, up to 50% for moderate income households, which cover 80 to 150% of the area median income. So that's going to provide a lot of coverage for a lot of people. So people have wondered, why should we go ahead with the Efficiency Main and the Freeport program if this money is going to be coming down the line? Well, let me tell you the reason why I think we should. One, this isn't in here yet. Who knows how long exactly it's going to take to get this program established. It has, it's run through the state. The state's program has to be taken back to DOE and the Treasury, I suppose, for approval and vetting. It's clearly going to be sometime in the future. I'm sure not before the beginning of next year, although there's still hope for later this year. But in the meantime, two things are happening. Someone who is not proceeding now it's continuing to pay the high energy costs that they're going to be um, not paying the savings that they would in, experience with the rebate program and, and financing and the reduction of, of heat costs is something that's there now. The other is, and I, I, I understand there, there is quite a backlog some, with some contractors for the the uh, installation. So I would think it would make some sense to, to get, get on somebody's um, list as soon as possible and get going with what's available. We then have, just following up, a showing of how, in fact, a loan has very small payments that would cover the installation of heat pumps. And the chart that Bridget had up that showed the gap between the electricity charge for heat pumps and the boiler charge for oil or gas uh, had a difference of about $1,500. So you can see that what someone would have to pay for financing is, is going to uh, cost less than what they would be paying if they did not make that change. Um, we then I have an example of how someone could walk through the somebody who's thinking, I want to do something. Um, Bridget has pretty well, very well explained where to start, to start at Efficiency Maine, the program of uh, criteria, going to the, the application of Freeport's application, which sets, uh, sets out the uh, income levels for participation of the 90% of areas annual median income. Uh, there's the loan that program that Bridget has talked about. Also, some local lenders are now making home equity line of credits and fixed term second mortgages. And there's a National Energy Improvement Fund that is a, an installer of uh, heat pumps uh, has an arrangement with to provide financing for heat pumps. Um, so after someone has gone to Efficiency Maine and talked to a contractor, they're going to end up with the determination, this pre-qualification letter from, um, from, from Efficiency Maine, then going to put in the application to Freeport, showing them either that um, qualification or if, in fact, they're coming in for a rebate after the installation that has been completed. A determination letter will be provided by Freeport to, that a contractor can see that this uh, customer has qualified for the Freeport rebate. So armed with the rebate qualification from both Efficiency Maine and Freeport, and perhaps a loan from the Efficiency Maine program, 
or a local lender, that person who may not have the upfront cash to make the, the buy and install the heat pump before getting the rebate will be able to turn to the contractor and say, look, this money is going to be paid directly to you after you've completed this work for me. So please, I have only a certain amount of money to put down. Will you work with me so that we can move ahead with this? So that hope, the hope there is that uh, this will, program will cover people that otherwise couldn't be covered. We also, as Bridget talked about, the list of participating vendors. We've got seven or eight right here in the Freeport area that um, are here that do this work and are available um, to be contacted, see what their wait list is, see what their, their terms would be. That's basically what I have. Thank you very much. All right, we have uh, just a, first I would like to thank all of the speakers for today. I'm very grateful that these people have shared their time with us today. Um, John Riley, Claire Batts, Richard Burbank from Evergreen, Melanie Sachs, thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Bridget from Efficiency Maine and Bob uh, for sharing with us. I would also like to thank uh, Vagabond Coffee for making this donation for us so that uh, keep us all warm. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan, who's a local kid uh, that started that company, Ethan Whited. Um, I would also like to thank FCTV3. This is an extremely amazing professional crew, and I'm very grateful to them. They are, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, appreciate you. They, they're going to put together a video of this, and it's going to be available on FCTV3 as well as the town's YouTube site, so that you can go back and look at anything you may have missed. Also, the presentations that you saw will be available on a separate page on the uh, Balsam Realty website. So if you go there, you can find a separate page of all of these different slides in case you missed anything. Jonas, can I mention one thing? No. Right behind you, thank you anyway. Um, <laughs> our copies of the uh, Freeport application and a uh, copy of my slide program, which is available for pickup. Thank you. <laughs> and um, again, just really grateful uh, to FCTV3 for being here. So that stuff will be available online on the website. Now, I'd like to introduce for some very brief closing remarks, and then we'll have the drawing for the uh, Balsam, Realty, Balsam Realty $275 home energy basket. Uh, but I, I'm going to be introducing Kathleen Sullivan. Kathleen is um, not a local, even though she tends to act like a local. She's a writer, a poet, and a uh, clinic. Well, you live here, but right? We're from away. We're not really Mainers. I guess we're local, yes. But we're not Mainers, right? I, I, that came out wrong. She's a local. She acts like a local, but she acts like she's part of Maine. And, and I think a lot of us that have come here from away are here because of that feeling that we get of being here and the togetherness. I mean, the, the mere fact that everyone showed up here today says a lot about our community. Um, but we're very grateful to have Kathleen here in our community. She's a writer, a poet, clinical social worker specializing in couples therapy. Thank you for that. Uh, she is a social leader in Freeport, willing to stand up for people, our town, and our environment. Aside from publishing poetry, Kathleen is also co-editor of the 2019 book, A Dangerous New World, Main Voices on the Climate Crisis. For some closing remarks, please welcome Kathleen Sullivan. I'll be very brief because it's, we're already five minutes over. But first, I really want to th thank Jonas. And I want to thank Kate and for all the work they did to put this together. It was just, and it's been such such a pleasure working with them. I didn't really know them very much before. I only, you know, went in and ate some really great salads, Caesar salads. They had the best Caesar salads. 
So, but I, you know, I, I really had never worked with them before, and it's been a really great pleasure. Um, as it has been a great pleasure, all the work I've been doing this year, and we've all been doing together for Fruitport Ken, it's been just an extraordinary experience because this is just an extraordinary community. Um, so just my closing remarks, very fast. Um, this has been an after, a morning of getting of data, right? All kinds of, of information and all these new words, peel and seal, wet cellulose, damp cellulose, honeycomb shades, don't use foam when you should use caulk. What happens in the basement happens in the house. I mean, you know, all this great data. Um, and I, I, it's gonna be really, but I wanna tell you what's, what I'm walking around, or, around with. So I lived in an 1803 house with a wet, damp basement for 40 years. And all those pictures have just made me traumatized again. <laughs> because I was sure there were crocodiles in our basement. I really wouldn't really go in our basement. Um, anyway, so it's been a great morning with all of you. But what I hope you all carry away from this is not only all that data and all this information and all this technology, but how much we all are, we are here because we care about each other. We care about people being warm and living, living you know, being able to pay their bills. And this is a terrible time for, for energy bills. Uh, and we care about the planet. You know, we care about being able to do whatever we can to reduce um, fossil fuel use so that this beautiful place where we live uh, right by the sea, which is about to rise, uh, will be as healthy as we can make it. So I just want you to take all this technical data with you, as well as how much you care. That's why you're here, how much we all care and love this community and this place. So thank you. <laughs>